Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening and uh, as we welcome you once again to another edition of Wednesday Nights with uh, Inayat Wadi. Now for many of us who have been following developments uh, of the unrest and the anarchy that has unfolded particularly in KwaZulu Natal and in the Gauteng region, it has got us thinking on how this entire saga has uh, unfolded over a period of time. Now obviously this started off with the incarceration of former President Jacob Zuma and then we saw the anarchy that had followed with looting and destruction. We've seen the criminal element creating mayhem and havoc, the initial silence that we saw or inaction on the part of the security apparatus. We've seen finger pointing. We've seen a lengthy discussions, debates uh, taking place on whether this was an insurrection or an attempted coup against a faction of the uh, governing party. And uh, obviously, we've seen vigilantism. We've seen uh, the uh, people obviously protecting their property. And uh, also, uh, worst of all, has been the racist card that has come through from a certain sections of society, paying for blood, threatening slogans. We've seen social media uh, filled with uh, all the rhetoric that has been repeated over and over again. Now, obviously, this comes against a background against uh, a nation that has held so much promise the last 27 years since we've become a democracy. But uh, there are many, many questions that remain unanswered. And some of them have been, have we failed a nation that has held so much hope and promise in this country? Have we miserably let down the millions who are in abject poverty, close to 50 percent jobless uh, that we see around us? Have we played into the hands of those few who want to see this country burned to the ground? Now, these obviously are critical. These are absolutely important questions that one needs to raise against the background of what we had actually seen. And uh, the answers obviously lie uh, with many of us, but also at the same time looking at the political establishment in the country. And that is the reason why. Uh, we have decided tonight uh, with the panel uh, talking about the political response to the anarchy that had unfolded in KwaZulu-Natal and in uh, Gauteng. Now, we have assembled a panel and just uh, up front, I would like to make it clear we had extended an invitation to the EFF. Uh, they have not responded to us. But uh, nevertheless, we have got uh, representatives from various parties, some of the major political players in the country. And we've got uh, Inshla Kanipo Ntombela from the ANC. We have Naren Singh from the IFP. We've got Dr. Makhosi Koza, Action SA, Ahmed Manzur Sheikh Imam from the NFP. And uh, we also uh, joined, uh, in fact, we were going to be having uh, Hanif uh, Hussein. Uh, join us but uh, from the DA, but he, unfortunately he couldn't make it, so we joined by Bradley Singh. To all the panelists, uh, good evening to you and uh, welcome to the show. Good evening, assalamu alaikum to you and to your listeners. It's uh, wonderful that you are able to join us now. Uh, I'm just looking at the screen right now. I see uh, Dr. Makozi uh, Koza has disappeared off the screen and also uh, looking for uh, the representative from the NFP, uh, Ahmed Manzur Sheikh Imam. But uh, uh, just to kick off, and uh, I would like to begin with you, Mr. Naren Singh. Now, for a very, very long time, we know uh, the country has been riddled with uh, a lot of problems. We know of the social problems. We know of the socio-economic problems that the country has. And uh, in the aftermath of what has happened, some have actually termed this a revolution. Now, when we're talking about a revolution, it's a strong word. But when one looks at the revolution, when one looks at the sequence of events that have taken place, we've seen uh, many say that it's a poorer class when one looks at the looting poorer class people that have not had food on the table, that have been, abject, that have been in abject poverty, uh, those that have not had jobs, and they have basically revolted, making their voices known. We hear about revolt within uh, political parties uh, against one faction, against the other. We hear about uh, revolts taking place by people, ordinary citizens, who have basically protected their lives and their properties. So all around, when one looks at this anarchy, clearly the signs are not good for South Africa as we stand right now. Well, uh, let me say I'm an eternal optimist. I've always been, and I don't think we must lose hope. What happened uh, a few weeks ago was uh, certainly unprecedented, uh, uncalled for, and something that will go down in the annals of history of South Africa for a very, very long time. 
as uh, regrettable. 1994 brought with it uh, political freedom, and we all enjoyed that political freedom. But I think from the day the new government took over, from, from April 1994 to now, the issue of economic freedom has eluded the majority of citizens in our country. We have uh, had tremendous strides in terms of provision of water, electricity, et cetera, et cetera, the basics that people require, which is something that must come with this freedom that they, that they all fought for. However, poverty, unemployment is something that still bedevils our society and has still not been adequately addressed by the government of the day in the last 25 or 27 years or so. And I think this put together with the challenges, as you indicated, that uh, are being faced within the ruling party uh, caused to a large extent what happened uh, a few weeks ago. It was a combination of internal dissent within the party, threats made by individuals uh, from the hashtag free Zuma campaign that they will bring the country to its knees. And of course, those that were unemployed and poor uh, rode on the bad wagon because they were encouraged to do so and, and they helped themselves to whatever they wanted. So, so, so the big question is, who were the instigators? What was the genesis of, of this anarchy? But uh, just to answer your question again, I am hopeful that out of all of this, we will succeed again as a nation. If we defeated apartheid in 1994, we can again defeat racism, uh, anarchy, uh, and, and, and build our economy to something that we can all be proud of. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Makozi Koza. Just to bring you into the discussion now, obviously, uh, Dr. Koza, uh, you know, you are not a newbie in the political landscape, although Action SA, the party that you represent, and you've issued, you've issued statements and uh, even calling for a commission of inquiry into what has actually happened. And uh, just in your analysis and uh, your experience in politics over the years, is when a situation like this develops. Uh, you know, we've seen many people knocking onto the doors of politicians. Firstly, to understand, you know, how much responsibility, how accountable are politicians at a time like this against the background of what, if, or what we've seen happen? Well, as a total quality systems developer, we always look at the root cause of the problem and the effect. And in addressing a problem, you've got to look at the root cause of it. We must not lose sight of the fact that South Africa had reached unprecedented levels of corruption in the sea of white sea of poverty. And as people watch, they are the people that are entrusted with the power to lead them, looting the state. Uh, the culture of looting was inculcated. And we also are saying, you also have a very fragile democracy because I don't think that we actually worked on building social cohesion in South Africa. And uh, as a consequence of that, when the police did not check in, they did not, they were not prepared. And mind you, this was not just an ordinary citizen that was going to be incarcerated. This is the former commander in chief. So there can be no excuse about why there was no preparedness for this. I mean, some of us were at the Polokwane conference in 2007, when there was a tussle between pre former president Ntabom Begi and, president, and former president Zuma. I mean, there was army that you have never seen before, the kind of ammunition that was there. So you can see that this was deliberate because if they were able to do such in 2007, why didn't they do this now? Even the kind of disagreement that you have, you have the president characterizing what has happened as insurrection, but you have then the, the, then the, the defense minister saying it's not. Then you also have uh, the whole fight between the Minister of Police and the Minister of, 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 of State Security. You know, as if that is not enough. You have a Minister of Police that is not in speaking terms with the Commissioner of Police. So everything that you are looking at is really telling us that South Africans have to wake up to the fact that what is dividing us 
what he is now looking as if it's racism and what have you, it's something that has been done deliberately by the ruling party by ignoring to address the education crisis in this country. The language barrier crisis persists. Bantu education has not been addressed in this country. The government has only decided that if it gives people social grants, that's all there is. And the truth is, the reality is that nobody can live on a 350 rand or 260 rand, whatever the figure is. The truth is we have not really dealt with the core of the issue and we have not enhanced or and built up the foundation that Dr. Nelson Mandela, O.R. Tambo, Chief Albert Lutuli, Amtika Drada, A.S. Chetty, all those people, Fatima Mir, all those people, they built a very solid foundation. But the leadership that we have that is so inherently corrupt, compromised and undone everything that our forefathers and foremothers did to build this country. Now we need to start rebuilding the country again. I agree with Singh, because we did it, we defeated apartheid together, we can still do it now. And that is why it's very important not to pay attention to and give a lot of time to people who, are, who seek to sow divisions amongst our people, because there is not a single human race group in South Africa that can claim to have delivered South Africa and South African democracy. Every single human race group in South Africa had a stake in what we have as a constitution of the Republic. Thank you for that, Dr. Kosa. Uh, uh, just to bring you into the discussion. Now, obviously, uh, you've heard uh, the very, very strong sentiments that have been expressed by uh, Dr. Kosa uh, regarding what has happened. And uh, the ANC being the governing party, being the ruling party, being the largest party in the country. And it is natural, it is obvious that... Uh, the ANC and the governing party will come under the radar, under close scrutiny at a time like this. And uh, we are going to see a lot of uh, uh, finger pointing towards the government in terms of what the government has done, whether there has been action, whether there have been inaction on the part of the government. And also at the same time, for far too long, we know what has been happening within the ruling party, the factionalism and all of that. Now, clearly, the citizens of the country, the voters of the country who have faith in the government require these answers from the government. Uh, if you could please unmute, uh, sir. Yes, it is true indeed. I think as a governing party, we acknowledge that there are challenges facing us as a nation, but also we have not been in denial that as an organization, there are challenges we are facing, which we are working on, trying to ensure that organizational renewal, organizational unity is a project we are still pursuing to ensure that the ANC as a governing party governs properly and ensure that it saves the people of South Africa. It is true again, I think as even the president alluded to that, that the government was caught wanting on some of the actions which transpired. It could have reacted in time and it did not do so. There is good about the ANC that when you admit that something has been wrong on your side, you admit that something indeed has gone wrong. But what we do acknowledge is that as a government, we have taken the responsibility of those matters. We are now hands on deck in trying to manage what has transpired. We have ensured that the security forces are reinforced, even with the army, to ensure stability within the province, in particular cases and in housing. We have ensured through government that we put through initiatives. I'm sure you have heard the pronouncement by the president the pronouncement by the Minister of Finance, the pronouncement by different ministries and departments outlining what will be done in correcting some of the wrongs which have transpired, what will be done to correct the damage which has happened. It is true that what happened as it unfolded, it caught the security cluster napping. There is an issue as the ANC we have raised for the rights 
Hence, we are happy now that we can see progress as you speak now. In Phoenix, more than 25 people have been arrested, more than 150 something firearms seized. So, after what happened there? So, there is action being done by government. Whether it's because it's reacting later, it is, but I think action is being done to say something went wrong and it can never be allowed to happen again. So, as the ANC, we admit on that, that indeed something could have been done better than what transpired. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, and I see him just said, uh, has joined us as well uh, from the uh, Active uh, Citizens uh, Coalition. Uh, we welcome you to the show, Imtiaz. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Right, uh, Ahmed Manzur Sheikh Imam, uh, if you could unmute your mic now. You know, just uh, listening to uh, the uh, uh, the panelists and, uh, you know, what uh, their assessment of the situation. Now, I think uh, on this platform, you have expressed many concerns in the past. And uh, the key question here is, uh, you know, looking at the issues that you have raised in the past, things like service delivery, things like poverty, things like the corruption that we see in the country that has been endemic. And would you say that, uh, you know, this obviously, the, the, the anarchy that had prevailed uh, is as a direct result and also have the chickens come home to roost? Well, 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 thank you for giving me this opportunity. But let me start off by saying, and without any doubt, that what we have here is factional fights in the ANC, two factions in the ANC, which is impacting on almost 60 million people in this country. We ought to have anticipated this because there were various threats made before the incarceration of uh, former President Jacob Zuma. The issue of the intelligence in this country has been raised many a times, even in, poli in Parliament, and I think Honorable uh, Naren Singh will uh, allude to that that uh, repeatedly we raise concern that you know we appear to have a greater risk internally than from external sources in the country so that's the other issue the question that arises is is this the beginning or is the end of this beginning that we've just had and clearly i want to tell you that this is just the beginning of what is more to come the attempt here was very simple it is insurrection. It's an attempt to remove the legitimate regime that is in place currently in order to put and replace them with those that will be sympathetic to the cause, particularly of those that have already been charged and are to be charged in the near future. The issue of delivery of services is a serious problem in the country, the socioeconomic conditions under which we live. Uh, the, you know, the the wealth of this country is still in the hands of a few. But again, the question we need to ask, why is that in a country where the majority of the people govern and despite putting in measures like BEE and the BBEE, affirmative action and, and incentives for small businesses, for black owned businesses, for women, despite all the efforts that is being made 27 years later, we still find ourselves as one of the most unequal societies in the world. As far as the security side is concerned, I can tell you the law enforcement to be in a state of recklessness in the country, lawlessness. And also we've indicated uh, many a times before that there are different laws for different people. If you look at the big conglomerates that have been found guilty of corruption in this country, all they end up doing is paying a fine and they get away with it. Others are expected to go to prison for it. So, you know, I think we need to deal with these things holistically. I want to reiterate, I think the problem has just started. The issue of race is not limited to South Africa. Let me start off by saying, remember not long ago, there were xenophobic attacks in the country. Remember the whole of Africa blames uh, the West for the state we are in. But where is the wealth? The wealth is in Africa. Who is controlling the wealth? Those in the West are controlling the wealth. Whose fault is it? That's our fault. So if we find ourselves in the situation we do, it is because of our own doing. There's no doubt about it. If you talk about unrest, let's take the N3 for that matter, particularly the Moy Tall Plaza. We have incidents there all the time. How many of these people have paid the ultimate price for their actions? Very few. And this is what the problem is. So there is no consequences. If you want to talk about corruption, what you're finding even with state capture is still the tip of the iceberg. There's over 300 billion rand a year lost in this country. 
as a result of uh, uh, through the procurement system through corruption that is what's happening where an item costs 10 rand you're paying 100 rand for you don't get value for money but let me tell you the problem is bigger than that i've always said where there's a corrupter there's a corruptee there's the public sector and the private sector but what is more important to understand that many political parties wherever they govern particularly sustain themselves through this corruption through these tender processes and things so if you want to close the gap to corruption then you need to deal with it holistically and it's very difficult if you even heard what the president said at the zondo commission that there were times that they've received monies then they knew it was wrong but they kept it because they need it now you can't do that in 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 a country of this nature when you have one of the most unequal society so so simply i want to say this thing is not over those that need to get to parliament and be in control to protect those that are now found wanting particularly from the criminal aspects or from the state capture are going to continue until they remove the legitimate regime and put those in place that will be able to protect them you can see the the president current president wants to deal with corruption and that's not going to suit everybody in the country and that's where the problem is Yes. Now, uh, just to bring Bradley into the discussion. Now, Bradley, I know uh, from what I've been told, and you've obviously joined us. Uh, uh, in fact, Hanif Hussein was supposed to be in the uh, year, but unfortunately, he couldn't make it. But obviously, standing in for me, and what he had briefed me is, you have been pretty close to uh, the people at uh, uh, in Phoenix. And uh, we know tomorrow uh, we're going to be seeing uh, the, the, the EFF obviously uh, embarking on some protest action that is going to take place. But the key issue here at the end of the day is when one looks at the race card and how the race card is being played out. And uh, this obviously is trading on, on, on dangerous territory because uh, this is what the entire country is talking about. Uh, you know, we, we've spoken about the sequence of events that had taken place. We've heard about where fingers were being pointed, but that seems to be dominating uh, the, 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 the uh, South African, the social, uh, so, social landscape in South Africa a lot in terms of racism and how this racist card is being played out, Bradley. No, thank you very much and a very good afternoon to your listeners and to the panel members. I think in the beginning, we must stipulate the facts. The reality of the matter is that this is an ANC internal problem that has now become a South African problem. And the ANC is now using race to shy away from their responsibilities of the insurrection and the anarchy, the looting, the lawlessness, that transpired over a few weeks ago. So we must accept the fact that if the police and the security cluster were visible and were able to deal with the issue, people would have not taken up uh, arms to protect their properties because what communities did throughout KZN, all they did was they protected their own properties because can you imagine what devastation we would have faced today if those communities did not protect themselves and protect their properties, their livelihoods, many shop owners, their businesses were looted. I went to Verulam, uh, just up the north coast there. And you know, when you see these business owners and the devastation, 30 years of hard work, honest living people working seven days a week, 30 years down the drain in under two hours. It is totally unacceptable. The ANC has let the people of South Africa down. The ANC is using race now and this incident to create more division and hatred amongst communities because they do not have the courage to stand up and say, this is our problem. We are going to deal with it and tell us how they're going to deal with it. It's because what happened in Nkantla a few weeks ago when the regulations were broken, the police did not act on that incident. And that was the sign to show people that the police is incapable of handling any situation in this province. And we have seen it on national TV, what transpired over the week. Now, when we come to businesses that were looted, many Muslim owned businesses in, in Durban, in, in Tongat, in Verulam, Chatsworth, Isafingo, they were all looted. Those people do not have insurances because they are small 
medium businesses. They cannot afford insurance because the economy is so tight at the moment. What's happening is that they're just barely making ends meet. And then you have the lockdown that's coming to place. That's putting added pressure on businesses. Business owners are trying to keep their staff employed just in order for everybody to survive. And we have continuous lockdowns. This could also be a serious issue that was brewing amongst the people where many politicians have said that the lockdowns and the ridiculous regulations that follow these lockdowns now have put businesses in a situation where they cannot survive. So unemployment is at an all time high in this country. We have the lockdown that's continuing and continuing. Our president is obsessed with television that he wants to come and address the nation. He failed to address the nation when he made his statement uh, and addressed the nation that night where he said, this is ethnic mobility. So he shied away from the responsibility. He could have said that this is an ANC problem. We are dealing with it. We want to resolve the matter. But when we talk about Phoenix in, in particular, it's important because I live in Phoenix. And there is no racial tension here in Phoenix. But you will hear every single politician, every political commentator will be speaking about Phoenix, yet they don't even know where Phoenix is. We live in Phoenix. I can tell you there's no racial tension here. It is unfortunate that there were some acts of criminality, and we condemn any criminal act that has taken place, whether it is in Phoenix or any part of this province. Over 285 people sadly lost their life. But this ANC government, this failed police minister who needs to resign immediately, still is pushing the race card. And every time he speaks, he is the one that is inciting more racial tension than anyone else. Because only when Becky Taylor came into the picture seven days after this unrest took place, then you only started to hear the race thing. Now, like I said, it is unfortunate that people took the law into their own hands. We cannot promote any acts of vigilantism in this country. We cannot prevent people from walking around. But Phoenix is on the border between uh, Amauti, Zwelisha, and Bambai. I was a ward councillor of Bambai. I know the community well there. Those people are law-abiding citizens. The people in Phoenix are law-abiding citizens. But because the mob came, and burnt one shopping complex in West Ham on that Sunday night. That is when we contacted senior ministers, senior officials in, in, in the SAPS. We told them, we begged them, get the army out here because the police will not be able to handle the situation. Police failed. Communities were protecting the police. Where have you heard of that? Where communities have to guard the police. But we had to protect the police because those policemen are risking their lives to also protect us. So you must understand that it's not a racial problem. It's an ANC problem. Now the ANC has nothing to do. The only thing they can do is blame Indians, and they are continuing with that. And then you have the EFF who are coming to Phoenix to march. What is the purpose of the march? What are they going to achieve in this march? They can't achieve nothing because the police is on high alert. SANDF is on high alert. They're going to walk for, what, 50 meters, go to the police station, give them a memorandum and go. But yet they will say Indian races. Indian people are not racist. Indian people live side by side with our African brothers and sisters. In Phoenix, there are thousands of African uh, people that own properties in Phoenix. They were standing at those barricades. They were standing on the front line, protecting their own property. So you must understand all communities did was protect their properties but it has become a race thing everybody is only concentrating on phoenix but why are we not talking about all the other lives that were sadly lost due to this unrest and insurrection as the president say so that is very important for us to discuss as well there is no racial tension in phoenix i live here in phoenix a few days after the shops were burnt in a Mauti, in Zwelisha and Bambai. Residents from those communities were coming into Phoenix to the shops. They were standing in line with Indians. 
to get a bread because of COVID regulations, you can only allow so many people into the shop. A simple thing like bread and milk, Indian people and African people were standing in the line together to go and buy bread. There was no racial tension. So people must not drive a political narrative to create a racial issue when there is no racial issue. You yourself can drive into Phoenix and see if there's any racial issue. Absolutely uh, not. Ready? Thank thank yes, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, I just want to bring Imtiaz uh, into the uh, discussion. Imtiaz, if you could unmute your mic. Now, obviously, the Active Citizens Coalition, and, uh, you know, we are talking about a serious problem that has brewed in the country. And uh, the key issue here is, uh, you know, looking at yourself, looking at your organization that have always been promoting social cohesion. Uh, you know, you've been on the ground, you know the situation on the ground, you know the sentiments that I experienced on the ground, and just your thoughts against what has happened and how this has actually impacted on uh, the active uh, uh, citizens uh, coalition, but also at the same time looking at this aspect of social cohesion. I think, um, you know, just to start out, I think I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on this platform as the active citizens coalition because it's a political party. But let me rather speak on... Um, the Itikwini Secure Platform and the mobilization of communities in terms of uh, their safety and security in the first three days of the attempted insurrection. And let's speak to the truism of exactly what transpired then. There was no governance. There was no law enforcement on the ground. There was no directive. There was no direction. And what we're seeing in hindsight and through our post-mortems on that platform, and, and, and let me not make this political. Let me stay, say that, state that again is that when we went on the ground, we went in as our original portfolios as activists in, in the security and safety space. And when we got to the ground, it was communities that looked to us as leaders in the community, as CPFs and whatever it is you want to call us, that what do we do? And our very simple thing was that you go out to the furthest point away from your home and you put up a checkpoint and you look after your home. Very similar to when it's raining, you'd go to your front door and you'd close it. That's basically what communities have done. On the back of a movement which speaks to freedom of expression and your rights as, 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 as a citizen or an organization or as a political party within this democracy, uh, and, and I'm speaking to the Zuma Must Be Free campaign, there came an opportunistic move where in it started out saying that Zuma must be freed, he must be tried correctly and all of that. However, our people are hungry and we must now go and loot. And this is where the criminal element came in. And rightfully, as Bradley had mentioned, that this is an internal ANC problem that's being fought through government. And that's a great, great, great challenge for us, where that spills over out of the bedroom into the, the, the fold of the entire community and an entire country. And that's really, really disturbing to say that if a party or an organization cannot resolve their, their, their issues internally, and they now mobilize entire communities to do it, we have a great challenge in our country. And that's just to speak to it from a political standpoint. But on the back of the, the racial slurs, we must speak to popularism. I mean, in the first three days, and, and I'll speak to the Sunday, the Monday, and the Tuesday, on the Wednesday, things were done and it was over because the reality of the situation of the ground had already hit home for those very individuals that were incited to loot and were incited to go into the shopping centers and take whatever they needed to take. But let us speak to who originally opened up that store and who eventually burnt the store. The in-between is the part I'm not too concerned about because that just became something that was opportunistic. You cannot tell me in reality that there was a grouping of mothers and children that went, for example, to Macro and literally broke those locks and opened it. I want to know who did that. And eventually, once it was all done, I need to know who went and put the match to burn it. Those are the people we need to find. And those are the people, the very community that had taken those fridges which no longer work and had stolen the meat that has now gone off, have to go and ask, where do we get jobs from and where do we get food security from? And that's something that's very, very important. Now that all of this is done and it's been almost two weeks and we're going into week three, you're going to see many movements coming about, like, for example, the Jackie Shandu issue. There's a whole lot of political parties. I was at Durban Central and I was at this. Let me give you some facts. 
there is not one white statement against Jackie Shandu. That's the reality. Bradley, I ask you to take that back to your leadership. There is no case. There is no statement. There is no such thing as one settler, one bullet in any docket. And he goes to court on Friday. That's the reality. So let's not try and be popular about this. The case number has been opened up by the state. All the statements that are in there, including mine, on behalf of the CPF, that, are, that I might add, states what we speak to. And we speak to four different things. We incited it on the 26th when he put out the march. He incited it again when he spoke on his press briefing on Facebook. He incited it again in front of City Hall. And he incited it again in terms of saying that Indians must be removed and sent back to Uganda um, on, on, on Good News FM or whatever radio station that was. Now, we must understand these things and we must speak to it. Who is bringing in the racial divide and what is the reasoning behind that? We've had an unrest. It was an attempted insurrection, which is basically an attempted coup d'etat. And we fully understand the dynamic of um, wanting to overthrow the government and do all of that. We get that. What we must applaud is the communities that protected us from having that happen. We must applaud them, irrespective of where they came from and who they were. They stood up and they made sure that our areas and our mothers and our children were not raped and looted. And we must also speak to the truism of what had transpired. It was right now we currently sit here and we calm, okay? But in those three days, it was utter, utter madness. People did things across all racial lines, across all social barriers, across all affluency ratings in a total level of madness because it was a state of madness. And that's the reality of the situation on the ground, right? Now, speaking to it and how do we move forward? My daughter's 18 years old and by design, I think just, uh, uh, I'll, I'll come back to you uh, in terms of moving forward because I've got uh, Naren Singh obviously uh, mm -hmm. has got limited time with us. He's got another engagement at eight o'clock. So I just want to bring Naren Singh into the discussion. Now, uh, Mr. Singh, obviously um, we've seen the statement come out of the IFP and also the leader, uh, the Prime Minister, Mangasutu Butelezi. And he made a very, very powerful statement where he says, and we know, and just understanding from the panel in terms of where the problems lie and how this problem actually came about. And he made a very, very powerful statement where he says, if there is any fear in acting against the perpetrators, that fear must be set aside for the sake of uh, all of us. Now, this obviously is um, a very powerful statement because in essence, what he is saying is the state is being held ransom as uh, by citizens uh, who have created this anarchy and the ability or the inability of the state to act. Because I think this obviously to find a way forward and India says find a way forward. But to find a way forward, one needs to find out who is responsible or who was responsible and more importantly, in terms of acting against the perpetrators. No, no, you're right. And thank you to all. And, and good evening to all the panelists. I didn't have a chance in the beginning. I didn't realize one could speak for as long as uh, some of them did. But uh, thank you again, Inayat. No, no, no. Prince Butelezi did make a very powerful statement. I mean, a, a day. In fact, even as the insurrection had started, he had called uh, the, the, the president of the country and indicated to him that there was a need for the South African Defense Force to be deployed so that they can support the police in, 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 in law enforcement. And uh, our very, uh, quote unquote, intelligent uh, Minister of Defense uh, went on media and said, what war is there that uh, Prince Butelezi is talking about? You know, there's nothing happening for us to deploy the Defense Force. And well, hey, presto, 24 hours later, we saw what happened. And then she had to eat humble pie. But even at that stage, the state had failed us. And, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, Ntlango Nipo uh, and Tombella there is admitting that the, there were serious shortcomings on the part of the state to, to ensure that communities were protect, adequately protected. Even the Minister of Police has now admitted that, you know, they, they, they just couldn't handle this. And, and there are reports of divisions within the police force at a local level uh, where, where some were just standing by and watching things happen while, you know, others tried to intervene so the whole system the whole state system state security system is rotten to the core and and i just hope on friday when 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 we've been informed that there will be a cabinet reshuffle 
that the first three people to go will be those involved in state security. But having said that, you know, it, it, it doesn't just take the replacing of ministers to sort the problem. This is a problem that we need to come together. We need to resolve. We need a president that's caring. We need, unfortunately, Prince Putelezi is at an age now where he may not be able to make a meaningful contribution, you know, in, in the next five or 10 years. But we need people like that to call for peace, call for calm. The intelligence of this country, the intelligent apparatus were caught totally napping. And, you know, I will be bold to say that those who planned this insurrection were 10 times more intelligent because the modus operandi, at, as Imtiaz had said, was so well planned. You had your first batch, your second batch, your third batch. You had your, you know, the looters became people that out of circumstances, they began to loot and out of poverty and hunger. But there were people burning buildings. And why did they burn buildings? So that they can build those uh, build those buildings. And we know about the organizations that are operating in and around uh, the Durban area in particular, and in KwaZulu-Natal, that when, whenever there's some construction taking place, they come in there, and government has failed. Government has failed, and I can tell you in that, the drug mafia were very, very instrumental in what happened. There's a taxi mafia. There's the tobacco mafia. All these mafias were armed to the core. And unfortunately, or for, you know, we must not bury our heads in the sand and think that all the, uh, the, the uh, road watch groups or neighborhood watch groups or the CPFs acted in a responsible manner. There were those people who acted in a totally, totally irresponsible manner, not only in Phoenix, but in other parts of, of uh, the other provinces as well. And we need to deal with them. Criminals must be dealt with by the courts of law. And, and then we, as the IFP, have said, whether you are a black, white, red, blue, or red criminal, you need to be dealt with by the courts of law. And we had vigilante groups. We had people that took the law into their own hands and really overreacted in the guise of protecting life and property. This is something we need to admit because I visited all 29 families that uh, lost people in, in, in Phoenix and Bombay. Personally, with Prince Butelezi arranging 300,000 rand, and take, we took 10,000 rand to each family at, for, for the funeral. And I can tell you, meeting those families, they were in distress. They were utterly destroyed and devastated that young people in their households had passed on. But they were not anti-Indian. They anti the criminals. And they've said, like Bradley has said, that they've lived cheek by jowl with all communities. And they haven't had a problem like this. In fact, it was the younger people who said, listen, we are born free. Don't talk to us about 1949 and 1985 and 1989. We are here to build a new society. And that is going to be our responsibility to build a society out, out of the good people that exist in all communities across the board. And there are good people in all communities. Thank you very Thank much you. for that, uh, Dr. Makozi, because uh, just to bring you back into the discussion. Now, obviously, I've seen the statement and I've seen uh, Action SA uh, asking for a full inquiry into what has actually happened. But again, this begs the question that uh, the entire focus is on the ground, on what has happened on the ground, what has happened in Phoenix. It's about racism. But yet uh, there seems to be, there still appears to be uh, a very little focus on the, uh, you know, right at the top and the buck stops at the top. And from what I'm hearing from the panel and, uh, you know, we've seen just so much against the ruling party at this point in time, uh, looking at action as a what are you seeking what are you looking for at this point in time first and foremost i think the most important thing for us as south africans and obviously as action as a yes we are a party but we are first of all south africans i think we need to get to as all south africans realize that the anc has gone past the descent by date like all liberation movements, they have a limited lifespan. As they become embroiled in corruption, so are the factions that get formed. And as we see right now, we have an indecisive president that is forever followed by bloodshed. And, and I am saying this without any fear of contradiction. President Cyril Ramaphosa, as the commander-in-chief, I don't care what other people are saying. 
I am putting the whole responsibility on him. He has not fired ministers who are corrupt. Just take the whole thing of, of ministers, William Kize, who is, I mean, there's, there was in Daily Maverick today, there is the whole dossier and he's still on leave. He has not been fired. And we had this indecisiveness, by the way, it's not just a, a new phenomenon or a phenomenon of the of, of Cyril Ramaphosa. Sing will recall that at some stage we had over 50 schools in Fuwani bent down over one night. There was no outcry. Nobody was, the, I mean, there was nothing that was done that was decisive. Minister of Education was supposed to be fired. I mean, security, state security, they were supposed to be fired. So we are sitting with a, a liability, and that is the African National Congress. And I think all the opposition parties, they need to now understand that the problem is not the Indians, it's not the poor people, it's not everybody else. It's the ineffectiveness, it's a, it's a polarizing ruling party that is using the state to pursue its factional battles and use, and that it's not a new thing, by the way. As I said earlier on, in 2007, we saw how the army was used. It, so it's not a new thing. And in this case, they decided to use it by it being absent by making sure that it's not there when it is needed most. So I am saying until such time that we remove the ANC in power, there will be no peace in South Africa. And, and no matter what Ndombela is saying to you now, let me tell you, the ANC always believes in this myth that it can self-correct. There is no self-correction in the ANC. I was in the ANC for 35 years. I fought corruption out in, within and I failed. And I can tell you, when it comes to defending that which is wrong, the one that is a moral voice gets strangulated and persecuted as it happened with me. And I'm glad that now that South Africans and from all of us here, there is one thing that I am hearing which is uniting all of us. We are all saying we must not allow the ruling party to use us and play a race card and make us pity one against each other. They are the ones in the first place that have created those conditions for racism to thrive because they never address Bantu education. And Bantu education was targeting specifically black Africans. It was meant to intellectually stunt them. The ANC never did that. All they did was just to say those that can that have the money can go to former model C schools without fixing the education system. And I'm saying that there is no way you can correct inequalities if you don't do that. And what I am saying is that we need to ensure that Minister Peggy Kelly is fired. Minister Ayanda Jojo is fired. Minister Nosbuema Pisangagula is fired. All those ministers, that's the starting point. And we are saying to Mr. President, Mr. President, you have to also fire as well in case that we can't keep on sustaining people who are stealing from us. In fact, the reason why you have this problem, as was said by one of the panelists, is that you know you have level four lockdown and you have people that have been really been pushed to the limit they, and and all these are all factors that bring about uprising but we cannot rule the fact that the ones this was indeed an insurrection but that insurrection unfortunately comes within that political party so minus south africa minus anc i think we have a best country I think we have the best country. We will find each other. I have, I'm very, very hopeful. Yes, uh, I'd like to bring uh, Nishlaka Nipo Ntombela uh, back into the discussion now. Uh, I don't see him on uh, camera. I'm not too sure whether... Oh, here we go. Okay, you're with us. Now, you know, you've heard uh, what uh, Dr. Koza has to say. And uh, looking at the ANC, the question of polarization obviously comes through. These are obviously very, very strong sentiments that are expressed against the ANC and against the ruling party. And also at the same time, I think just uh, following up from what Mkia said, and he cited the example of uh, Jackie Ishandu, and uh, we see people in the name 
of the ANC making these type of statements, making inflammatory remarks. And uh, this is the reason, I think, why the sentiment that the ANC is encouraging uh, polarization. Just your thoughts and your reaction to these sentiments that are being expressed. Let, let, let us be clear that there will be individuals expressing their own opinions which are not necessarily the opinions of the party. So when you speak of Kalni Hausi, when you speak of uh, any other people, whether they call themselves any other names, they are not speaking with the authority of the ANC. The ANC has been clear that one, there has been problems which we could have handled better. The ANC, through the Premier and the Minister of Police, they spoke a day or two days ago, outlining a program of social cohesion, of trying to rebuild the bridges between the communities of the Indian descent and African people. Because they've consistently lived together for the past 20 years in Phoenix, in Chaswet, in Verilem, in North, and in all of those areas there have been no problems. The problem has been criminality. Whether it's criminality of any race, it can be defined by race. Vigilantism which took place in Phoenix must be categorized as such. Looting has been criminality, it must be categorized as such. So the government has been clear on that, that indeed there have been problems and we are working now to try and turn around the corner to deal with those issues, notwithstanding the organizational challenges, notwithstanding the inadequacies even in the government response. Those are the issues the president has taken into confidence and we believe at the right time is going to make a pronouncement that indeed there are challenges within the executive, there are challenges within the security cluster which must be attended to. So. The difference with President Ramaphosa is that he takes time to deal with the issues. He deals with the details. Hence, when you speak of the issue of Minister Mkize, the SIU was given an opportunity to investigate. They have made their findings now. There is a clear, detailed report on what transpired. And of course, we don't doubt that the President will act correctly on those issues in the best interest of the country. The same will happen on our review of what has transpired in the last two weeks. The National Assembly has set up a team to also investigate what happened or did not happen. Out of all these processes, a number of portfolio committees have been visiting the province to interact with the affected communities to get their views on the issues. And out of that process, concomitant action will be taken against individuals who have seen it done wrong. The last NEC put a clear statement that let us identify and isolate all those individuals who are doing things which are wrong, which are anti-ANC, was what the ANC stands for, stands for unity of the people of South Africa, stands for peace, stands for stability, stands for social cohesion. So the ANC message has been clear and very concerned, the official message of the ANC. But when the social media, when the media, the public broadcaster, or any other media outlets allow any Tom, Dick, and Harry to speak on behalf of the organization, then you'll hear those consequences. So those people speak with no organizational authority. They speak on their own factional groups. They speak on their own factional interest. They do not speak on behalf of the party. Thank you for that. And uh, Ahmed Manzur Sheikh Imam, uh, to bring you into the discussion. Now, I know uh, you've posted uh, certain uh, video clips uh, on social media, <laughs> and you've made, uh, I've heard them. In fact, I've seen those video clips as well. And you've made it very, very clear in terms of, uh, you know, your feelings, your sentiments, your thoughts, and your party's thoughts as well on what has actually happened. Now, you know, we are obviously talking about uh, the ruling party. You have been in parliament for a very, very long time. And uh, knowing how these processes work and uh, sometimes, and I think this is what the general public looks for, is uh, 
sometimes these things are not dealt with the urgency of the uh, 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 situation that it actually demands. And uh, this is where we have a problem because what has happened over the years as well, when one looks at corruption and how this is unfolded, and we seem to be dragging our heels, commissions of inquiry, we spend millions and millions and billions of rents uh, trying to just investigate. And at the end of the day, when something happens, when something like this happens, we see it actually blow up uh, into the face of the country and the nation. So just uh, you know, looking at obviously the urgency of the situation, what should the government be doing immediately right now? now as we speak all right let me just start off you know based on, on those videos and things that i actually posted and what actually happened in phoenix there is no doubt about it that the south african poor police particularly the law enforcement including the metro police endeavor unable to deal with the problem in fact i've been awake all day and all night and communicating with them i was told in no uncertain terms by the highest ranking officer in the police force in kwazulu the term Honorable Imam, there's nothing we can do, and I'm not supposed to tell you this, but there's nothing we can do. It's up to the communities to defend themselves and protect themselves. That's exactly what he said. They were in a state of hopelessness. So what communities did there, and let us also admit that through social media, there were reports and reports and reports, okay, expecting violence in Phoenix. What are the people supposed to do? People were in fear. So people went out there and put barricades. Not that it was a pleasure to be on the streets the whole, all day and all night. They went there to protect their community. In that process, some of them might have acted criminally. And if they've done that, they must pay that the ultimate price for it. There is no doubt about it. But like Phoenix, all over in KwaZulu-Natal and Kauteng, people went up and put barricades. If you speak to the chairperson of the CPF in Phoenix, he'll tell you at any given time he had to go through four barricades to go home. So people were scared, they were protecting themselves, and that's what they had to do. They had no choice. But coming back to the issue, I want us to understand that the problem is bigger than we think it is. And let me tell you why finding a solution is not that easy. Number one, the intelligence in the country is compromised. Remember, it all started in the conference in the ANC to elect a president. It was a very close finish almost 50 50 that is what happened that's when we ought to have realized this country is going to have serious problems that's where it started now the intelligence is compromised from people from both camps the defense force is compromised from people in the both sides the south african police service is the same the metro police the same even the political structures in all three spheres of government are split between the two camps now that is going to and that is why today you would find the investigations have not found the main culprits who are the root cause of what is going on. And you're not going to find that anytime soon because even the investigations are being compromised at the moment. Now, that's the first thing. Now, it's, it's not easy. Take the president himself. What did he do? He went out there and tried to unite his cabinet and he took people from both camps. With good intention, it hasn't worked for him because you can see the president said one thing, the minister of defense says something else. He talks about insurrection. She says, community, where did you get it from? So they're not on the same page. I agree with, 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 with Bradley as well, that the minister has been the one that has been making racial statements about Phoenix. It came from him. It started from him. Without And, 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 and if you speak to the national commissioner who's responsible for operational matters in this country, we ought to have allowed the investigations to unfold. And when it is completed, then we know exactly what has happened and, 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 and make statements. But no, the minister is insisting that it is racial violence. And the people that you have speak and spoken to have made it very clear. There's nothing to do with race. Now, I've been in Phoenix yesterday. I'm going there tomorrow. The EFF is expected there. And we're going to address them tomorrow on these issues. But one of the issues of racism uh, brother United is coming because political parties and leaders, knowing that the majority of the support in KwaZulu Tel is coming from the black community, are the ones that are promoting this racism and the statements that they are making are inciting violence between the different communities. And I agree with my colleagues that the communities of Phoenix and others live peacefully side by side for decades. I think almost every Indian home in Phoenix employs the black male or female. My family alone in Phoenix Industrial Park employ over 450 people. There's no incidence of racism. But coming back onto the issue of how we're going to actually deal with this problem, the first thing we must understand that the ruling party, the party that is governing at the moment, and the next election is only in 2024 when you'll be talking about a national government. 
the important thing to understand is that they're still in government. They're still in governance. They are in charge of this moment. And their fight is going to continue until they split, hoping that uh, Dr. Koza's words are true, that eventually maybe they will split and that this country can get true representation of people that are committed and passionate and dedicated. What I think should happen is that all opposition political parties, all peace-loving South Africans who want the best for people in this country should all come together and give the support to the president of this country to deal with the levels of corruption and deal with the levels of insurrection in this country. Because if we're not going to do that, I can tell you now that the ANC fight between the ANC is going to continue impacting on all of us and they're not going to stop, I can tell you. In terms of race relations, we've gone back 50 years with all the gains that we have made. And it's not going to be easy to, uh, to be able to achieve that social cohesion in South Africa anymore. It's going to take a a lifetime to be able to do it. So I think we need to work together and give our support to government. And yes, in our own way, maybe the best thing to do is eventually remove the, 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 the current, the ANC and have a more inclusive government in South Africa. Yes, uh, we thank you for that. Uh, Bradley Singh, now I see the DA has issued a statement and obviously uh, the DA is pretty skeptical uh, obviously calling for a, a parliamentary inquiry, but also at the same time calling for full uh, transparency. Now, this uh, is uh, of major concern to the DA in the statement that has been issued. Yeah, I know you're absolutely correct. The reason why we are calling for a parliamentary inquiry is because you will get independent people to assess the situation of what really transpired in KZN and in particular Phoenix. But, you know, when you have independent people doing that, you know a report can come where it will say the security cluster failed, the police failed, Metro Police failed. You know, the surprising thing is that whilst uh, police were unable to attend to certain areas where there was looting and, and burning of, of property. But ANC politicians had the police protecting them, while the people of this country had no police, where they had to protect themselves. But Mr. Intia has raised a very important point, and I must allude to that, is with regards to Mr. Jackie Shandu and the statements that he made. The DA KZN leader, the DA provincial leader, MP Anif Hussain, MPL Sharon Hussain, and many other provincial leaders were at Durban Central to lay a charge. And Mr. Saeed is correct that the state opened a case against Mr. Shandu and not any particular political party. Just like how Mr. Saeed and all are, uh, have given information, we also have given evidence into that docket. So when political parties say to you that They've opened cases. No, they're incorrect. Mr. Said is right. The state opened cases and various other people who were affected by those statements submitted documentation to build a case against Mr. Shandu. But Mr. Presenter, you know, it's very important to ask yourself this one question. We've had billions of rands down the drain, burnt. Our economy is in tatters. We've had citizens who were arrested for looting and other criminal acts that they've been charged for. But the one question one must ask is, how many ANC members have been arrested? And the answer is zero. So the whole country knows that the ANC is the cause of the problem, the root of the problem, but zero members arrested. And then they want to blame a DJ in Johannesburg for insurrection. It can't be correct. And Another thing you must understand is we've seen the premier, our premier here in KZN, assaulting a member of the public while the looting was taking place. So what kind of leadership is that? Has the premier been arrested by Becky Kerr? No, he hasn't been arrested. He's sitting next to him and making more racist statements. So you must understand that this is an ANC problem. The ANC will never apologize to South Africa. Never. So the only way we can remove them is through the ballot box whether it's a realignment of politics or whatever the case is but it can only be done through the ballot box 
I have Muslim families and many of them have told me they were strong supporters of the ANC and that is a reality. They've said enough is enough. We will never vote for the ANC again. They're going to be voting for other political parties and they must vote for the DA. But another thing we must talk about is that when we visited schools in this province, 137 schools were, were burnt. But prior to the unrest, 305 schools in Mkanyakure, the municipality couldn't provide water for children in 305 schools. Now that is the ANC government for you. So what do we say to ourselves as a Department of Education? 305 schools during COVID, we visit schools as members of the legislature. Those children are packed to capacity in a room because the rest of the classrooms are damaged. If it rains, you must sit with an umbrella in the classroom. You've never seen that. If you be in the rural areas in this province, I promise you, you will cry if you are sincere about children's education. You will cry. So what we have in a Tikwani to what the children have in the rural areas is chalk and cheese, chalk and cheese. But we visited areas that were affected by the looting. And I must bring you to a young African entrepreneur, three service stations, one in Komashu, one at Duba Village, and one in, in, in Stanga in the North Coast. The whole three of his BP service stations were burnt to the ground. And, you know, we had a chat with him, an open discussion, because he's a young entrepreneur. And he told us, you know, when the guys were looting his store, he was looking through the CCTV camera footage. And he said, no, it's fine. Maybe they're hungry. They can loot it. It's fine. But they burnt it. So he can't understand why they burnt it. But he said what really broke him was that the very same people that he saw through his CCTV were the people that he helped their children through university. When there's funerals in the community, he's helping them. When people need food, he's supplying them with food. So that is what broke him. And he said, that's the one thing that he can't understand. Why burn it? And specifically, why target his three BP stations? So is there some kind of plot that was targeting him directly? He doesn't know. He doesn't want to speculate. But if you can put two, two and two together, you will understand where we're coming from. But you know what he said? And this is very important. Because at each service station, he employs about 60 people through the shifts and, and all that with the guys in, 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 in the convenience stores. He's managers, you know, 60 people. So he says to us, you know, the president comes on TV and gives his address and say, we're going to take care of all those people who were affected by this riot and who have now become unemployed. We're going to take care of them. But he said, that's only lip service. Because you don't understand the administration that has to go through that before those people get paid that money. They'll be hungry. You are guaranteed of that they'll be hungry before they can receive their first payment from the TES uh, system. So whilst we give in lip service, we must also be able to provide. And there's a lot of red tape. And one more thing, uh, Mr. Presenter, I think all panelists will agree with me. The biggest problem we have right now in South Africa is that one side of the ANC is using state resources to purge the other side. It is evident and you can see clearly. That is why our intelligence services lack intelligence. Because if they only had some sort of intelligence, what happened would have never happened. Imagine if we went to war with another country they would have ran over us in under 12 hours because our security forces were dead as a dodo. Thank you, Mr. Presenter. Thank you for that, uh, Imtiaz, uh, to bring you into the discussion now. You know, uh, obviously, with your involvement with uh, the Active uh, Citizens Coalition and also Etiquini Secure, and you and I have had many, many chats, you know, week after week uh, in the morning show, looking at issues on the ground and at grassroots level. And I think this is uh, important for us to understand is damage control. This is yes. uh, going to require a lot of time. It's going to require a lot of effort. It's going to require a lot of wisdom as well. 
to uh, yeah. you know uh, repair whatever damage has been done from a social cohesion perspective and any other damage in terms of how skeptical people are in terms of dealing with each other. And I think uh, starting off at grassroots level and just to look at some of the thoughts, some of your ideas in terms of how do we approach damage control. I think um, we need to start out firstly at the beginning and, and, and I'd call it an apology. Currently, there's no political party and there's no one taking blame for this and saying we apologize. Something has happened. How do we move forward? That platform of debate hasn't started as yet. And that's a cause for concern for me. Because as long as we defend what has transpired and we don't accept that there was a mistake and something had happened and an apology needs to be given. And let us be clear, the apology needs to come from the ANC government because it was this, this very thing that caused this insurrection. Now, I'm going to speak to it in terms of something that the ANC has called CADA deployment. Let us speak to that. And let us try and understand it. How does one grouping of people that come from the same background in terms of the liberation movement fight with another grouping of people based on the fact that they have an opposing view? And this is why we see an ineffectiveness within SAP and within government to not deal with the issue, and that's the reality. And we can expand on it and we can go further, but I don't think time would allow us that. But I'm saying there needs to be an apology because it was an in-house situation that could not be resolved in-house and it filtered out into masses of people doing whatever they want, irrespective of race, color, creed, or political affiliation, but it just became opportunistic and it went on. Now, the question I raise right now is for you and I being normal senior citizens, I'd call myself, is that we, we find ourselves in a, in a space right now of understanding that we can sit on this platform coming from different political backgrounds, but speak the same language. And that's very important in terms of cohesion, that we can understand each other and we can move forward. But those sorts of discussions need to transcend to the granular form of the ground. And we need to start creating that rhetoric that Go back to those people that have incited you and ask them for food security and do all of those things. My daughter had come back from school way in. By design, she is part of a multiracial school, right? Because I wanted to grow up in that, in that situation. And she comes back to me on Monday afternoon and she says, Dad, school's not the same anymore. My friends look at me differently. And let us speak to that. And let us now take our children back 27 years where we were. Now, when we came in in 27 years ago, we came in on a peaceful platform in a place of democracy. And now our children have to work through this coming out from a violent background of three days. How do we work through that? So in terms of having an understanding of how do we move forward, those platforms haven't even started as yet. They haven't started. We can't go through this without firstly understanding where the problem was. And as uh, Dr. Makosi Koza had said, that we need to have commissions and we need to have this and that. And I get all of that. But I'm saying we need to hit the ground hard running now. It cannot be that we're going to have a commission in six months' time about what happened a year ago. That's not going to work. Let us hit the ground running hard now in every aspect of everything and let's start these debates and discussions. And I'll give you a very simple example. The likes of Cato Man and Chesterville and all of that had contacted me and said, our children go to school within your Indian areas. We need to provide safety and security. We came up with little memorandums of understanding at police station levels to say, guys, if you ensure that there would be no further violence, irrespective of what the political climate is in the country between the 10th and the 13th and the 23rd, if you can guarantee us that there will be nothing coming from your part, we will guarantee from our side that we will now start to normalize. We cannot say that we will normalize overnight. There will be spurred interruptions here and there, but let us look at it like that. Now, with all due respect, gentlemen, and sorry, lady, with all due respect, we see unrest all the time within our country. It's everywhere. It's happening here about water and this and that and whatever. The problem with what had happened was that all of it happened at the same time together. At the same time together. And just like that, our response as political party parties, as leaders in community, as community policing forums, and as every single civil body that exists in order to bring stability to the crown, ground, 
we need to do all of this together in our own way right now together instead of trying to argue with one another that's the most important message i have for you thank you yes uh, mr singh uh, i'm glad that you basically stayed on and uh, i know you wanted to leave at eight but uh, it's wonderful and i think just uh, you know what imja is saying and uh, uh, Imtiaz, I know we're all getting on in life and you mentioned about, you know, at our level and at our age. And I know, Mr. Singh, obviously, you've got uh, a rich history in politics. But uh, I think the, what, what what is most concerning is what Imtiaz has said is, uh, you know, he cited the example of his daughter saying that uh, it's not the same or it doesn't feel the same uh, like it used to. And uh, we all know that we want to leave a legacy for future generations. And looking at the responsibility, the accountability on the part of politicians to create, to make sure that we obviously are going forward, that legacy, we leave a positive legacy, a legacy where our children can grow in the society and not obviously being exposed to what we have in the last two weeks, you know, and carry that with them in their lives and then again creating a, 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 a negative uh, mindset. And also at the same time, we hear about this all the time, that there are people, there are young people that talk to us and say, that, should we not move? Should we not emigrate? Should we not get out of the country? Because that is the one issue. And there are also talks about, you know, whether other countries would accept South Africans as refugees in their countries. And we know we've accepted refugees from right across the entire world, the entire continent into this country. But these are talks, these are uh, mindsets, these are thoughts that are, are, are being floated around. Yeah, and I thank you very much. I've, I've managed to delay my commitment till 8.30, my next interview. So I'll be with you until 8.30. But thank you very much. No, no, I think I, I have to agree with the MTS. You see, we've got to have a build-up approach. And using young people as a catalyst for that is going to be the way to go. And, you know, I've got grandchildren that go to schools with the, all other children. They don't have this race, color, creed, uh, divisions. It's opportunists within our society. And unfortunately, some of them are political opportunists that are fueling this fire. And like I said in the beginning of the show, you know, I've gone to each of those families in Kwamashu, in Nanda, Bombay, uh, uh, and even in Phoenix. There is no general anti-racism sentiments. There, there's a feeling of despair and disgust at what happened and the way it happened. But by and large, I am saying, let us galvanize the support of the good people in this country of ours. You know, they say if you want the devil to do its work, Satan or Satan or whatever we want to call it, it takes good people to sit down and do nothing. It's time good people came to uh, came, uh, come together and do the right thing. And I think the way that communities came together, I mean, I was talking to a nephew of mine who lives in, in quite a fancy estate on the North Coast. And then and he says, he says, you know, mama, it's the first time I got to know my neighbors and, and I knew the neighbor's neighbor. And we, you know, we were talking and having coffee and it brought that camaraderie and across the race group. We need to have local initiatives in my own particular areas. And Dr. Uh, Makozi Koza knows where I live. You know, we've brought communities together. We've created uh, uh, like a joint committees to talk about poverty in the area, development in the area, et cetera, et cetera. But you do it as joint committees, as neighbors. And I think local initiatives from the bottom, we can build up to ensure that at the upper level, we can change things and don't have opportunist politicians and presidents and political parties trying to, you know, uh, decide for, for all of us because they are the majority. The time of majoritarianism needs to end. I think there needs to be inclusive governments, right? We must use the best talent that's available, you know, to the country at any given moment in time. And that's what we need to do. Unfortunately, in the ruling party, if you can you want to address a rally of a thousand people, if you can sign 2000 memberships, and my colleague will agree, if you can sign 2000 members, then you become a minister. Not on your ability, not on, on what talents you have. You become a minister because of populism. And that needs to change in our country. So I'll leave it at that. But I'm saying I'm very hopeful that we can build. It's not the ashes. You know, Phoenix, you rise from the ashes. It's not the ashes. And we must not lose hope and despair.
we can get together and build this country to make it a beautiful country that Tata Nelson Mandela dreamt of. Well, Mr. Singh, thank you very much for that and for staying on thank as you. well. Uh, we wish you all the best and uh, please take care. Good luck, colleagues. Sorry I had to run. Thanks. Yes, uh, I want to get back to uh, Dr. Makozi Koza now. Uh, you know, we have been talking about damage control, obviously, which is one issue. But also at the same time, one needs to instill confidence in the country, uh, confident in a, a, a future, a, a bright future, uh, particularly looking at uh, uh, the younger generation and against the background of where we find ourselves in uh, with all the problems, uh, with the unemployment, with lack of opportunities, with being exposed to the type of violence that we have been exposed in uh, the last two weeks. And uh, obviously there is concern on the part of youth that, you know, do they have a future in the country? And looking at parties like yourself, looking at political parties, you know, uh, in, 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 in embracing uh, confidence uh, or, uh, in, in the youth and more importantly to inspire them that there is hope, there is a future for them in this country. You are absolutely right. I think first of all, let me just thank the Salamidea for having brought us together because this is something that is lacking in this province. Uh, we tend to be so focused on our narrow political uh, interests as opposed to taking issues as a society. And I'm going to, to challenge Imitia Said and say to him, you know, as part of doing this damage control in KZN, I wanted to say, if you could assume the convener position of all the political parties, the peace-loving people, the reason why I'm going for you, it's because you are coming from a civil society, you are coming from community organizations. And I think we need to be getting more people. Yes, we must draw all the other political parties because at the end of the day, guys, whether we like it or not, it's the future of our children that is at stake. Many those, especially those coming from poor backgrounds. I'm telling you, we have a poor African families. As you know, we had racial capitalism in this country and we still have those. But we must not forget that we have working class Indian children, you know, that, we, that, that won't have money to relocate to Australia or New Zealand or wherever. We need to rebuild our country together. Each human race group has a stake in this country. And I think we need to bring back the culture that we had during the 1980s, the mass democratic movement culture, where you had the religious formations from different religious formations, you know, um, different interest groups coming together and being able to converse because this province, let's face it, it's been going through so many political killings, but we have not addressed those. We have our children, I mean, even the violence that is in schools, it's just crazy, you know? And, and what we need to do now, because we need to salvage this, there is no country in the world as beautiful as South Africa, I don't care who says what. Maybe I'm saying that because I'm South African and also I'm well-traveled. You know, and, 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 and this is the beauty. We've been always, we've always, you know, existed side by side. And I would still reiterate re what I said earlier on. There is no one human race group in South Africa that can claim to have brought about this new democratic constitutional demo dispensation on its own. Every single racial group, whether it's white, I mean, whether you're talking about even Helen Sussman, we can't discount her role simply because she's white. She was a lone voice and she spoke. Whether you are talking about, you know, you are talking about uh, Chata Matala, I mean, uh, Omar Latif that I used to deputize as a mayor. I mean, we, we come from a country that wants to recognize people for their abilities. And, and the reason why I'm saying this is because in 1996, the very ANC 
elected Omar Radif. He was not a black African. As the mayor of Maritzburg, and I was his deputy. We need to go back to that. And, and, and I'm very glad that in Newcastle, we've been very lucky as Action SA because the people of Newcastle, I mean, unanimously, I'm talking about our Action SA members in all the 34 branches, voted unanimously for Faisal Kasim. He's not necessarily black African. I think we are holding our people back by using the race card. I think most South Africans, they wanted to address these inequalities. Most South Africans, they want a prosperous South Africa. And I think we needed to do that. And I'm hoping that uh, Imitai Syed is going to accept my proposal to say to him, can he actually be the convener so that you don't necessarily have some of us coming with our own narrow agendas so that we put the citizen first. We put the people first. The reason why we are so polarized is because we've forgotten that we exist because of the people. We've just seen the people as just voters, as the voting folder, and not necessarily as psychological beings, as economic beings, as, as social beings. We need to go back to the drawing board and then we can start articulating this. Imagine what will happen if all of us were to come as the people of Wasulu Natal and just speak with one voice in terms of what we envisage with this province. I am telling you that will restore the confidence even of those that were even considering taking, cashing in their insurance money and relocating somewhere else to invest. We need to keep those people. You know, we can't just be blaming the ANC now. What we need to now be doing, we need as all the people of KwaZulu Natal come together and chart a way forward that is putting the citizen first. And we must also be speaking to our, our communities, speaking to the business people, speaking to the poor people, and, and start addressing these issues together and telling them to stay. So there is so much good in South Africa. And believe you me, I do believe that if we can do that, that will be the first step to restore confidence of the people to take over the leadership. UDF was a very good example of that. It had everybody, the leadership. I mean, all the Muslim community members, they were part of it. And I'm saying as Action SA, we would like to say, it's time for us to put our differences aside and start putting the citizen first. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Koza, Ahmed Manzur, uh, Sheikh Imam. Now, uh, you know, we are talking about damage control, but uh, sometimes uh, damage control becomes difficult under a climate where we continue seeing inflammatory remarks being made. And for instance, uh, even people that are not uh, held to account. And uh, for instance, the march that is tomorrow, and uh, I don't know uh, whether the EFF changed the poster thereafter, but when you advertise on a poster, march to Phoenix against racist Indians, and then change it again to march to Phoenix. Now, obviously, you are already sending a very, very strong message. You're sending a powerful, powerful message that you want to continue with racial polarization. And this is where we're talking about uh, being impotent or the inability uh, of the powers that be to act against people, particularly prominent people who appear to be getting away with this type of behavior and these type of actions. Yeah, yes, indeed. I must agree with you. You know, uh, I like what uh, Dr. Makosi Koza has said. The difficulty we have here is this, and I can tell you this solution can only come from political parties and political leaders working with civil society organizations, with religious leaders from all religions that can come together with you know, programs in school and things. And yes, it is affecting the children already in school. In fact, I got a call yesterday, the South African police services, I mean, they've been working for decades with each other and suddenly, you know, they are being insulted, saying that, you know, it's your brothers that killed our people in so you can see where this is actually leading to. But you are absolutely correct that when statements are made of this nature inciting violence and racism and, and hate speech, uh, 
you know, and there's no consequences for that, then people continue to do it. And remember, some of these people want political relevance. Now, let me tell you why I say it's a bit difficult with political parties, even though I believe the solution comes with them. If you take parliament itself, there's 14 political parties. They never willing, even the opposition is not willing to all sit together and say, let us put our differences aside for the interest of this country and its people. Let's work together. Now, if we believe that, you know, we, uh, the ANC is going to be a thing of the past and going to be just, just disappear. I mean, we're living in a fool's paradise. The ANC is going to be here for a long time to come. Whether they'll be in governance or not, yes, that's another issue. And, and, and indeed, you know, what happens is when you have a great majority like the ANC has, that's what makes it very, very difficult. It comes back to the issue even of an inquiry. How independent can an inquiry be if, if the majority of the members of those structures got to belong to the ruling party in any event? That's why we are saying you need the United Nations to put in an independent inquiry as to exactly what happened to uncover exactly what is going on in South Africa at the moment. So I think that a lot of dialogue needs to be entered with the different role players, particularly it is politicians and political party leaders that are inciting this hatred and this violence. And it's got to come from there. But if there's, you know, one rule and law for one person and another one for somebody else that breaks the law all the time, what is the message you are giving out to the people then? That's the problem you're sitting with. But, uh, you know, I believe that if we can come together collectively, all the opposition political parties, together with the ANC, because remember, there's an opposition in the ANC now. You know, there's two sides to the ANC. And not all people even in the ANC are either corrupt or are doing the wrong thing. There are those that are committed, dedicated, and passionate. Dr. Koza is one of them, and that's why she left. And she's correct when she said that if you do the right thing, you know, in politics particularly, if you do the right thing, you've got too many enemies. You do the wrong thing, you've got too many friends. And that's why she had to leave, because you get persecuted. So we should... Like-minded people from the ANC and all other political parties should come together. It's only together can we get a message to the masses that we are one united South Africa. Let not us not allow political parties and leaders uh, to drive this wedge between us for their own selfish reasons and their own self gain, because that is generally what is happening in the country. And I want to plead to our colleagues that let us work together Remember that all political parties got their weaknesses, they got their strength, they got their infighting. Everybody's got the same thing. There's no doubt about it. But if we believe that the ANC is going to be a thing of the past, we got it wrong. They're still going to be part of politics. Yes, from reliable sources, what I've heard is that there's going to be a split. I think Dr. Koza might know about it. There will be a split. The problem is when there's a split, who's going where? That's what we have to worry about. And that is why we need to start engaging those like-minded, committed people with integrity that want to serve and make South Africa a better place. There's a lot of work to be done, brother, United. a lot of work. You know, like I said, we've gone back 50 years. And the only people that can do it is the political leaders because we are creating the problem. Let's be honest. It's not the religious leaders. It's not civil society. We, the politicians, are creating the problem and we have to find the solution. The only way is to come together and work together in the interest of the country. We must agree to disagree on points, and we're always going to agree to disagree. But important thing, we need to put the country first and its people. If we're not going to do that, I can tell you the future is very bleak for us at this point in time, because the infighting in the ANC, like it or not, is going to continue. It's going to continue. It's going to be detrimental to uh, the lives of our South Africa. And then very importantly, lastly, we need to come together collectively and find how, because the ANC is clearly failing in improving the quality of life of the people and addressing socioeconomic conditions, uh, you know, and, and, and deal with radical transformation in the country. Maybe we need to all come together and come up with common policies, you know, and vision for people in the country that we can take it forward. Because if you're going to have an idle youth in the country, that's going to be a destructive youth. 74% of your youth are unemployed in the country. There is no plan whatsoever with the ruling party at this stage to, to employ these people, let me tell you, to boost economic growth in the country, to deal with this current problem that is not there. So I'm saying we have a, a, the, the, the opposition parties in parliament and those that are not there. You understand the more competition, the better is. Let us come together and create a conducive platform that we can work together and come up with ideas and policies and and help the so-called ANC that we have in the country to drive this economic growth in this country and create a better quality of life for our people.
Yes, uh, Bradley, you know, you've heard what uh, Ahmad Manzur Sheikh Imam said and also Dr. Makozi Koza in terms of collective, but also, uh, you know, in promoting this uh, collective effort in terms of action and this collective vision that we actually speak about requires uh, even leadership, uh, you know, collective leadership to be visible, uh, you know, to be out there for people to see that this is what our leadership is all about. This is what the leadership is actually promoting. Now, just your thoughts, but let's look at it from a leadership perspective in terms of driving this collective vision. No, thank you, Mr. White. Thank you very much. I think first, before we go to collective leadership, let us understand where we are right now with regards to damage control. In any democracy around the world, in any first world country, what transpired in our country in the month of July is actually an embarrassment. But there were no political consequences, absolutely no political consequences. It cannot be that ministers refuse to resign. It can't be. The security cluster ministers have to resign. They can't wait for the president to fire them. They failed they must resign. That is how you build leadership in a country. When your political leaders were elected, they were not appointed there. All those members of parliament are elected. So South Africans go to the ballot box to elect members of parliament. The majority party, which is the ANC, and Mr. Imam said that they've got the majority. But if you look since 1994, their majority is shrinking. Their majority is shrinking. And other formations and other organizations are building on that majority that is shrinking. Now, when we come to political accountability, where is the political accountability? There is no political accountability. When this province was in total chaos, the constitution of the Republic of South Africa clearly states everybody is guaranteed freedom and security. The residents and the community and the citizens of KZN had no freedom and had no security. So where was the constitution? Now we must come to the point of rebuilding. The president needs to fire these ministers. He needs to clean his cabinet up in order to show South Africans that I'm serious about leadership. Because our president is missing in action. Now, you can't have a president who is missing in action. He is the head of state. He is the commander in chief of our armed forces. He was supposed to be in the front line. And the reality is that the president spoke consecutively on two nights. The first night he spoke, he said ethnic mobilization. The next morning when we woke up in Durban was total chaos. Nobody listened to the president. Then the night, on that Monday night, the president came back and spoke on TV. It was even worse on Tuesday. So it goes to show you that nobody listened to the president. While the president was giving his national address and discussing the looting and the anarchy that was taking place, on the side screen on your television, on ENCA, they were showing you the public looting while the president was speaking. So where's the respect for the leadership? So the president needs to get his house in order. He needs to act presidential. He needs to take decisive decisions and clean up his cabinet of all these looters and these thieves that's there. Now we come to reconciliation. The ANC has to include all political parties to rebuild society because the public votes for different political parties. And let me tell you something, Mr. White. South Africans are very cultured and religious individuals. You know, if you go into the rural communities, they respect their chiefs. They respect their religious leaders. Even here in the city, we respect our religious leaders. We respect our elders. So we are very cultural people. And whilst we are law-abiding people and cultural people, we listen to our elders. So when political leaders are inciting violence amongst each other, 
Now you must understand that the ANC has been playing the race game with Indians for years. Let's start with municipal auctions, for example. A simple thing like municipal auctions, simple thing. They don't allow white people, they don't allow colored people, they don't allow Indian people to become bidders. That's this Itikwani municipality for you. They are racist. Right now, we've got a problem in the Itikwani municipality. They can't elect a deputy mayor because they put a colored candidate up front and the ANC councillors refused to support that colored candidate. Hence, the meeting collapsed. Now you want to tell us you want to build unity. Our chairperson for arts and culture, and I sit in the arts and culture portfolio committee, the mandate of the arts and culture portfolio committee is to build social cohesion in this province. That's the mandate. But he is marching somewhere for Zuma. And then he wants to march to the Phoenix police station. What he should have done was got religious leaders together. He is the leader of religious pastors in the province. He should have got them together and said, how can we work together with all races to bring unity in our province? Now we have everything that is stable in our areas, and especially in Phoenix, everything is stable. There's no racial tension right now in Phoenix. So if anybody who, tell, who is telling you there's racial tension, they are just blowing hot air, that is all. But we can't have situations where people still want to add fuel and build on people's emotions. You must understand something, Mr. White. If you only own one property, your complete life savings are in that property. And then you see on TV the <laughs> destruction. And you imagine my family is going to go through that destruction. What would you have done as a law-abiding citizen where the police could not protect you and bring law and order? You had no other alternative. And like we said, if there were any criminal elements or any criminals that committed these criminal acts, they must face the full might of the law. Because for a few individuals that cause chaos and, crim and criminal activities, a whole community of over 500,000 people can't be labeled as racist. It is absolutely... Uh, Freddie, uh, absolutely. I know we are obviously, we, we are running out of time. We've got about 13 minutes to go. So I'm going to go across uh, to the panel and I'm going to give you about three minutes each. Uh, Imtiaz, just uh, some closing thoughts and uh, your closing remarks. You've got about three minutes. I think uh, very quickly, just to go into the issue of the pandemic corruption that, that exists, that, that is something that needs to be robustly discussed and we need to engage in that discussion properly to start eliminating those issues first and foremost before we move in any direction. And uh, to, 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 to Dr. Makosi Koza, I appreciate your, 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 your suggestion and, and obviously we can look at it out of this uh, platform. But I think the main issue for us is that as a community, and, and, and in communities in general, we have started idolizing criminality. We look at criminals as people that we look up to. And that is that rhetoric needs to change ultimately. And, 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 for the, for, and not just for us, but for the youth moving forward. But I want to close with this issue, the issue of racism. For me, in my personal point of view, and it's a rhetoric that I'm going to push, is that I don't believe that racism exists. I believe that we discriminate based on affluency. We discriminate within our own communities based on affluency. Those that are rich associate with the rich. Those that are middle income, they associate with the middle income. And those that are poverty stricken associate with the poverty stricken. And that has become the norm. We need to start changing that attitude. And the only way we can change that attitude, if we continue with the issue of racism as a rhetoric, then for the youth moving forward, the economic transfer of wealth will never happen. So we've got to speak to it in its true form. Affluency is a problem in our country. There's the rich, there's the middle income, and there's the, those that are poverty stricken. Now, in order to bridge that gap, we cannot be pushing a racial rhetoric, but an economic one. And how do we build that bridge? Now, if we're coming, in it from, coming and looking at it from that way, I'd go back to something that I call the maid's cup syndrome. Back in the day, many people of different races used to have a specific cup for the domestic worker at home. I ask you today, if the mayor or the deputy president visits, visits your home, would you give that person the maid's cup? No, you wouldn't. So you discriminate based on affluency. And that's the rhetoric we push. 
We're saying that racism doesn't exist. Because if you came into the likes of Overport and Sydenham and in Phoenix and in Chatswood, there were people of all color, creed or whatever. But if you stood there as society and you said that we stand together united and we will not allow our areas to be taken, then you stood for justice. That is something that needs to be applauded. And that is something that we need to look forward to and build unity within our communities. Shukran for that, uh, Dr. Makozi Koza. Uh, you've got about three minutes and uh, just your thoughts uh, also on a media because uh, I heard you mention obviously using a platform like the Salam media platform where we sometimes we don't have enough of these type of discussions amongst ourselves irrespective of our background which political affiliation we come from but these are important these are useful discussions and sometimes also the mainstream media actually tends to shy away from these type of discussions and yet they have influence they can influence the thought process they can influence the mindset of people in a positive way i think one of the things that we need to do is to um enhance the use of technology and i, I think we need to understand that nowadays we are no longer necessarily dependent on the mainstream media to push our own narrative and um which is why i do think that what uh, sala media has done is 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 quite a, is is it must be commended and i think we should be encouraging this and this type of um type of uh platforms must be used one of the things because i may i, I must tell you i believe that part of the reason why probably i'm i'm aligned with you said because Part of the reason why in South Africa we, we always revert back to the race issue is primarily because the issue of Bantu education was never addressed in this country. We had Bantu education designed specifically to intellectually stunt Black Africans. Now the ruling party comes in as a liberation movement. And I think this is the tragedy. The first thing they ought to have done was to address the education. In fact, I mean, we saw what Mugabe, even Mugabe with all his sins, he knew that education is the primary thing that you need to address when you come to power. That is why, I mean, Zimbabweans, you will find them, of course, the, the negative knock-on effect of that is that when they are confronted with challenges, they simply leave the country because they can they they, they have skills they can they can that can be absorbed by other countries. So what we need to do in South Africa and together collectively is to really address the issue of Bantu education and the language barrier crisis. We have not addressed the language barrier crisis here in Guazulu Natal, which is a homogeneously linguistic province. We have not introduced, you know, an education system that is going to promote bilingualism, which is going to have both English and, and Isisulu. You know, and, and to me, I think the, all these issues are very important. And I want you to say, let us start building this together. We can do it. And I believe that we've already started. The fact that we've had this, uh, this platform, we can only build from it. And the, tomorrow we will be saying, this is where we started that was Zulu Natal, a social cohesion forum or whatever that we're going to be calling ourselves. But we need a structure that is going to give direction because most of the things that we are saying here are all similar. We all, we may have layered differences here and there, but overall, we agree that we need peace in this province. We agree that our children are the primary motive forces for all of us. If we don't do anything now, our children and grandchildren, they will, they will despise us for having sold their future. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Ahmed Mandur Sheikh Imam, our final thoughts? Yeah, thank you for that. You know, I must agree that the quality of education in South Africa leaves a lot to be desired. 60% of those going to Tibet colleges fall uh, 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 fall out in the first year alone they don't make it to the first year alone and 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 that is because of the quality of education even at the tivert colleges 
So everybody wants to go there. The skills needs of this country, the Tevat origins don't even speak to it. You have an abundance of one skill and a shortage of the other skill. You repeatedly draw the attention of government, they'll do very little or nothing about it. The other issue is the issue or you know, the socio-economic conditions of the people. If we're not going to deal with it holistically, then we're sitting on a ticking time bomb, particularly the high levels of unemployment amongst the youth. And that is why I think we need to come together, you know, like-minded uh, political parties and other organizations to be able to pave the way forward and to be able to having a more inclusive country. And even the, you know, government at this point in time, you know, it seems like we need a, a more inclusive government, maybe a government of national unity to take South Africa forward. Because really, I don't think the ANC in this point have what it takes in terms of leadership, quality leadership to be able to take us uh, forward. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see, I mean, your Minister of Basic mm -hmm. Education knows very little about what's happening in our own uh, department, in our own schools in the different mm -hmm. provinces. You can see exactly what is the situation of the healthcare in the country. The minister of police doesn't have a single idea as to what is going on. He can't sit in the same room and have tea with his national commissioner. So, and you know, the minister of intelligence, uh, you know, didn't even know about. According to her, two days before that, she informed us. But clearly, the intelligence in South Africa is not working as well. So clearly, I think we have a governance uh, uh, a crisis in the country. There is no doubt about that and we need to be able to but brother you know, i want to also draw the attention of the media itself media can either make or break this country and to a very large extent the mainstream media is also playing a very divisive role in south africa in terms of their reporting particularly when you know there's so much of hate speech and divisive statements that are being made by certain political leaders and things. And they tend to promote these things. They know exactly what to expect. So they're not helping the cause in terms of, of being able to. We must never rule out the fact that there'll always be a third force also in this country to want to create this havoc and this hate between the Indian and the black communities as well. So there is no doubt about it. You know, I believe that we need to do. But I think it will also be wrong for us to just bash the ANC. It's an ANC having a problem. Like I said, many other political parties have the same problem, even in terms of who they employ in the race groups that they employ. I think what is important to note that ANC is going to be part of this country for a while, maybe not with the size, but you know, people there that are dedicated and committed. And that is why I say uh, we need to come together and be able to try and pave a way forward to work together in taking the country forward. Uh, uh, and I think we need to understand very importantly where the president comes from, the difficult situation that he's sitting. He's split because he's got two camps in his cabinet alone. <laughs> and it's not an easy decision. That is why we, as opposition parties and things, need to come together and assist him to drive this thing forward. But I want to tell you, in my observation, sometimes people felt that in Parliament, I've been defending the ANC. It was never that. I've always said, rather than just attacking and attacking and attacking, you know, it's easy to attack a ruling party. Let's find solutions. Let's and go out there together, you know, and, and, and make a difference. So I think if we can just work through collectively, we can address these issues of, of and let me say this racism does exist. I've been a victim of racism. I can tell you it's been all over social media and everything just because of the color of my skin. It does exist whether we like it. It exists with the Indian community, amongst the Indian, among the different. And I want to tell you what we've got to be very careful about. If you notice what is happening right now, brother, a very important point. Your ports, there's an attempt to move them to the Eastern Cape. The Ford Motor Company and its investment is talking about going away to the Eastern Cape. Your vaccines that were supposed to be manufactured in KwaZulu Natal is going to go away to the Eastern Cape. Let me tell you, if you're going to move this economy to the Eastern Cape, you are going to create a tribal war in this country where black on black violence is going to start again. And that is what yes. we have to be very careful about. That's you know, obviously, uh, that's, uh, that's a topic for another discussion, but uh, obviously we are running out of time. Uh, Bradley, you can have the final word. No, thank you very much. And thank you to your viewers for listening to us for almost two hours. I think this engagement was very good because you'd get first-hand experience of what's really happening in KZN. And the important factor to take into consideration is that the ruling party and the government of the day has deserted the people of South Africa. And this problem is just not over last week and, and what transpired in July. It's not. If you look at the lockdown, 
when the, when the country went into lockdown in, in 2020 March, there was about 61 cases. Now we have millions of cases. This country did not plan, this government did not plan to have the vaccines purchased. The complete vaccine rollout was a total disaster. By doing that, by not opening up the country, we are continuously shrinking our economy. We need to survive. We cannot allow and accept that unemployed people must get 350 rand a month. How would they feed themselves with 350 rand a month? If you had to divide that by 90 meals, it'll give you an amount of around 3 rand 88 cents. Now you tell me what you can buy with 3 rand 88 cents. So government must not come and pull the wool over our people's eyes. We must create an environment to ensure there is freedom, fairness, and opportunity for all South Africans. We must create an environment where the economy thrives. We are able to create employment. We build investor confidence. We get our small and medium businesses up and running again. And the sad reality is that the Muslim community who own shops in areas in KZN have suffered the most. Their businesses were totally looted. And it's going to take them over a year to recover from this devastation that they face. It is a reality, whether you like it or not. Government can try and play the blame game, but the ANC must apologize to the people of South Africa. And Mr. Imam says he feels sorry for the president that he's got to deal with two camps. That's not our problem that he's got to deal with two camps. That's his problem. He wants to be president of the country. He must deal with the issues. Why must he make it our problem? And we must live in fear. We have security guaranteed in our constitution. Let us uphold the constitution. Africans and Indians, I will tell you again, have always lived in peace and harmony. We've never had a problem. We have children who go to the same schools, Indian and African. I myself went to a school with a lot of Africans because I lived in Trenant's Manor. It's on the border of Amauti and Phoenix. And the Amauti community came to the same school. We integrated. We got along fine. Up till now, we still get along fine. So there is no issue. It's just that we must not allow criminals to come and take over our lives. That's what we've done as, as a community. We've allowed criminals to take over our lives. So in essence, the only way the public can take this forward is through the ballot box. And we must not allow the ANC to come with their spin doctor tactics and allow Julius Malema with his hatred for other races. He hates other races. He is a racist because he hates other races. And this is not the first time that he has picked on other races. It's not the first time. This is an ongoing issue with Mr. Malema. He continues to pick on minority communities. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, thank you very much for Brady as well. And to, to all the panelists, and I see uh, Inshla Kanepo and Tobela, obviously he uh, disappeared. Naren Singh, also Dr. Makozi Koza. And uh, we appreciate your sentiments. And I see you've just typed something on the screen, which says, uh, thank you all for such a brilliant and sober engagement. Let me encourage Salam Media for such a great uh, initiative. Please circulate our respective contact details. We certainly will, and we do appreciate uh, your sentiments uh, for that, uh, Dr. Koza, as well. And also to you, uh, Ahmed Manzur, Sheikh Imam, and also to Bradley Singh. I know that was at the 11th hour. You were told to come through, and also, if you say it, a uh, few minutes before we started the show, you were informed that you would be a participant. But we do appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully we will have a lot more engagement of this nature. And Bradley, you spoke about the elections, and I'm sure Salam Media will be able to, obviously, facilitate some of the election discussions that we will have. We know that uh, we will be having our local elections going forward so I'm sure there will be still a lot more that uh, we will be able to discuss and engage with all of you. Once again, I appreciate your time. Please be safe. Take care and uh, all the best to you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for giving us the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you very of course, much. Of good Hey! All the best with action, South Africa. Good. Eh? <laughs> we would <will> pass. <laughs> yes.
Well, that brings us to the end of uh, this discussion, the panel discussion, once again, Wednesday nights with myself, Inayat Wadi, the political response to the anarchy in KwaZulu Natal and accounting. Uh, remember uh, the uh, this entire interview, if you have missed, uh, missed it or missed part of it, uh, will be on the Salaam Media Facebook page. You can visit the Facebook page once again and you can view this entire interview. There are many comments that have come through from viewers as well. You can actually view those comments. But for now, it's time for me to sign off. And until we meet again, once again, next week, same time, same place, on Wednesday nights with myself, Inayat Wadi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.